Hi, everybody. My name is Marius Gregoriou. I'm a senior uh, dev manager at Nordstrom in the spaces of Kubernetes uh, CI CD build tools. And hello, my name is Emmanuel Gomez. I'm a principal engineer at Nordstrom. And I um, just want to say there's a ton of really great content going on. So it's exciting to see you all here. Thanks for coming. And uh, it's an honor to be here to present for you today. Yes, and welcome to 101 Ways to Crash Your Cluster. So the two of us have been heavily involved with the adoption of Kubernetes at Nordstrom, um, all the way from uh, incubation to implementation and now um, at scaling. And Nordstrom is a fashion specialty retailer um, founded in 1901, based over in Seattle, Washington. Um, and we've got uh, hundreds of stores nationwide and recently opened some stores in Puerto Rico and up in Canada. Uh, and uh, we love Kubernetes. Uh, and we're serious about using Kubernetes um, over at Nordstrom, and so we're using it for uh, a wide gamut of microservices that are powering different parts of our business, reviews, gift cards, purchase orders, and so on, and, uh, and even parts of Nordstrom.com that are a bit more uh, recently updated. Um, and, uh, and we also uh, rely on Kubernetes to run a bunch of the dev tools. Um, so things that our engineers use. Oh, hello, I'm on auto somehow. Auto advance. I'm not sure how or why. This might be scary. OK. So uh, anyway, uh, not only do we use the dev tools, but also the, um, uh, the uh, enterprise logging and monitoring stack. Parts of that are running on Kubernetes. So we have, uh, we use Kubernetes for a lot. Um, but uh, if you're interested in stories with happy endings, then you'd be better off going to some other talk. Uh, don't get me wrong. I mean, Kubernetes is great. But just go to any other talk. You'll hear about how wonderful it is. Um, uh, it is our solemn duty to bring to light tales of mishaps, bad luck, and calamity. Um, we'll be telling uh, a series of short stories beginning with unfortunate events uh, down at the node level, and we'll work our way up to disastrous cluster-wide um, incidents. Uh, and you know, as we start off, don't discount those node level events, because before you know it, they can spread across your cluster, and you'll have a major problem on your hand. Um, you know, you and the, wow, OK, PowerPoint fail. So you and the audience have no obligation to remain. Honestly, I advise you, if you have a weak stomach, to turn immediately and find something more pleasant instead. Um, so uh, our first tale begins with uh, the way most, most tales and issues tend to, to happen is when you see a node go not ready. Um, and when, when that happens, uh, the first thing that we do is, um, is we just go kubectl, describe node, see what's going on. In this case, kubelet stopped posting status, not uncommon at all. Um, and it just so happens that our, our end users also said, hey, our applications running on this node um, have stopped responding. So we decided we wanted to go take a look, see what's going on with that node, log in firsthand. Um, and so we go SSH into that and just sit around, wait, wait, wait. Looks like SSHD is also unresponsive. So meanwhile, we go digging through our logs. And unfortunately, our logs are scrolling by so fast, and we're not really sure what we're looking for. Um, uh, and eventually, uh, SSH gets through, and everything is nice and good. Um, and so the node seems to have become happy again by the time we got there. Um, so unfortunately, we couldn't see anything when we finally got onto the node. But then we looked into the past. So we collect our metrics. They go into Prometheus. and. Um, and so what we found out was memory utilization on this node reached up into the 90s. And then right before we were able to log back in, there's this crash. And um, a lot of memory got freed up. And suddenly, somehow, that got correlated. So we knew that we were looking for, uh, we were looking for something that was related to memory utilization or memory, memory kills. So now we were able to query our logs for something more appropriate. And so we found something like this in the kernel messages. Uh, we found umkills, and we found page allocation stalls on that node. Um, and so we wanted to really understand the mechanism through which this was going on, because we didn't run out of memory, not entirely. Um, uh, so we went to Google about page allocation stalls. And back then, there was nothing. If you actually do that now, you'll find some other unfortunate Kubernetes user who's running into the same problem. 
Um, but there was not a lot of information, so we cracked open the Linux source, source code, um, searched for that string, and read, I think it was like page alloc.c. Um, and so what that tells us is that when you go and allocate a page of RAM, the kernel's gonna go look for it. Um, it may need to perform memory compaction, and if your memory utilization is really high, well, then, um, then, uh, then it could take a really long time to get that memory. Meanwhile, none of your applications are running because everything is, uh, is frozen. Um, now, eventually, that's gonna time out if it takes too long, and that's when it, the um killer gets involved. Uh, so not a pleasant experience, and it turns out the way this happened is while well, we were running Prometheus on our node, Prometheus gobbles gobs of RAM, um, and then we had a ton of Flink pods also on the same node that, that, that were dormant. And one of our users would initiate a job, and all the pods would just wake up at the same time, and um, they would wake up at the same time and then burst in terms of memory. Our memory utilization would go sky high, and then the machine would freeze. Um, so that's, that's what happened. And the way we got to that information is just really following a standard checklist of troubleshooting steps. Now, this is really pared down. I mean, if node not ready, this is in the event of mem high memory utilization. You know, we look at the nodes, we figure out what's going on. Kubelet stops posting node status. Um, and then, um, uh, so then we look for uh, signs of high resource utilization and finally the um kills. Uh, so uh, what was the fix? The fix was to set our Kubelet flags correctly, primarily eviction thresholds, hard eviction actually. So, um, and uh, there's documentation that tells you all about this. Uh, I suggest you read it very closely because it's easy to get wrong. Um, and um, so uh, what you want to do is you want the kubelet to enforce a memory limit global across all pods. And once that hits, you want it to evict immediately. And you want to evict early because it takes time for the kubelet to respond to memory pressure. And so you don't want it bumping up against the Linux um killer and then your node going unresponsive. Uh, so once you're doing that, then I would also recommend you look into, excuse me, I'm gonna make a little edit or hit the button here. I think this is gonna help. All right, okay. Uh, so you should probably also look at cube reserved and maybe even system reserved flags to make sure that your node agents and your system demons all have enough resources to operate. So that was, that was our kind of our, our small story and it was fortunate that this didn't spread to multiple nodes. It was fairly contained, but you can imagine that somebody could write the page allocation stall or daemon set that's just gonna rip through the cluster and cause havoc. Uh, well, we didn't need that for something to rip through the cluster and cause havoc. We ended up seeing this one day, uh, and there were more nodes down there which actually were ready. These are the not ready ones, um, which is about half of it. And so, you know, the first thing you want to do is panic, and then the second thing you want to do is not panic. Um, <laughs> Uh, so we have to resort back to our, to our run book and, and you know, simplify down. We take a look. What's a node up to? A look at stopped posting status yet again. Um, we want to look for signs of high resource utilization. And in this case, we found that um, resource utilization was not consistent across the nodes that were affected. And in fact, um, a lot of the nodes were not utilized at all. Uh, so it couldn't have been that. Um, you know, and so when you see a lot of nodes just kind of pop out of existence all at the same time, it makes you wonder, maybe this is like a networking problem, kind of like net split from the IRC days. Um, and so we go to our cloud provider, happens to be AWS, we take a look, we say, what's the networking status? Is it green? Yes, it's green, or they claim it's green. Um, <laughs> it's always a network, right? You always blame it on the network. So there's only one way to find out. So we actually go try to log in the machines that are currently posting not ready. No problem, we're able to log in. And then we say, well, let's try to hit the API server from these machines, because maybe that connection is somehow down. And no problem, we're able to reach the API server from these nodes. So what's going on doesn't look like a networking issue, must be something else. So we look through our kubelet logs, we look through our API server logs, we just find a lot of warnings, a lot of information, a lot of 
red herrings, absolutely nothing that we could identify as a cause for this. And then eventually everything just kind of cleared up. And we can walk away and we can pat ourselves on the back, job well done. <laughs> Except for when it happened again at some point, like months later on, on a different cluster. Um, and then again and again. Um, and this was a really hard one to track down, but eventually we were, we were tracking down the clues each time this happened, and we were eventually able to put something together, and it looks something like this. Usually 50% of the nodes go not ready all at the same time, but sometimes 33% or even 25% go not ready. Um, and then it, it, every time this happens, it's always all the nodes kind of pop at the same time. And they also happen to come back at the same time. And in fact, every time they go not ready and then get ready again, that time window, the time period where they're not ready always happens to be somehow just like almost exactly 15 minutes. <laughs> now it's starting to feel like we're dealing with a timeout. You know, maybe, maybe it is network related after all, but maybe we looked at it the wrong way. Um, so we scratch our heads trying to say, well, what did we not look at yet? And it turns out, well, we didn't look at our load balancer logs. And so let's go to those ELB logs. So a little bit about our architecture, we have high availability masters, which means that we have multiple IP addresses for the, um, the API servers, and the kubelets need to, to go talk to one of them, and well, we've got an ELB, classic ELB in between. Um, and so we look at the, the ELB logs, and they said, oh, we're gonna scale down one of the instances behind the scenes. Transparent to you. You don't know about this until you know about it. Um, and, uh, and that preceded the incident every single time. So what is this all about? How is this happening? Um, well, it turns out that there was uh, an, uh, actually multiple issues over on GitHub, but this is the more general case because it turns out that this issue is not an AWS specific problem. The problem was that the kubelet didn't have a timeout in the heartbeat over back to the API server. And so the 15 minutes, well, that was TCP retransmission. Um, <laughs> uh, the quick fix for us was to use network load balancer. The claim behind that is they can handle connections that are open for months or years. I'm not sure how they tested the open for years part. Um, <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe a time machine. Time machines solve all problems. Um, but, uh, but it was finally fixed in 1.7.8, uh, and so if you're running a current version of Kubernetes, you probably don't have to worry about this instance of this happening, but you never know. Um, so I'm actually going to hand it over to Emmanuel now, who's going to tell us a story about the day that our robots turned against us. So yeah, so here we move from node level outages to, well, multi-node level outages to cluster components going haywire. So as Marius uh, mentioned, we run on um, AWS as a cloud provider, and we have uh, run the cluster autoscaler component uh, as a way to manage our spend and kind of keep our infrastructure provisioned according to our workloads. And one day, we came to find that uh, our cluster was shrinking. Actually, we found out after the fact, our cluster had shrank uh, to something around a third of its original size. And this came up as a user report of, uh, my workload's not running. That's never a happy moment um, as a cluster operator. So first stop, um, we uh, took a look at the, uh, obviously consulted the API server to see what our node, you know, what nodes were being reported, found the, the shrank size, and then proceeded to go and um, check out our AWS ASG, the auto scaling group scaling history, uh, which helpfully reported that yes, those nodes had been terminated, and yes, that had been requested um, and happily complied with. Um, let's see, and the um, next top was to go check the cluster auto scaler because knowing that this component is running and interacting with the um, auto-scaling group APIs. That was a logical culprit. And um, auto -scaler group, or the auto-scaler logs reported that utilization was observed at 0.0. .0. So um, we have the auto-scaler set to both scale up and scale down. When it observes zero utilization, it's going to happily scale down. Um, 
problem was utilization was not zero. Um, so um, we were scratching our heads about this for a while. Um, we had this one incident, which was or significantly impactful. Our cluster was still operable, but a um, number of workloads were impacted. Uh, but it didn't uh, recur at the same scale. And this is truly a sad tale, because we have not been able to determine true root cause on this issue. Um, uh, a couple of things that made that difficult was that we had diagnostic data age out in terms of the numeric telemetry and logs that were aggregated. Um, we were trying to you know, use that data uh, while it was available to try and understand the issue. But we didn't get to the root cause during that period of time, and we didn't do the work to durably capture that in a long-term way to be able to go back and look at it. So furthermore, we didn't um, have the data to go open an upstream issue about this and potentially save somebody else the trouble. Now, a couple of things uh, about how we worked around it. We, um, well, as it says here, we extended the smoothing function. So we, so we slowed down its scale-in behavior, both uh, reducing the number of nodes it would scale in at, at once, as well as the interval between scale-in events. So that gave us time to respond um, so that we wouldn't get sort of bulk, uh, bulk killed which is clearly a workaround, but at least gives us, you know, even if this is a middle of the night incident, uh, gives us time to kind of get somebody at a keyboard and intervene before, before we're in a catastrophic situation. Um, in addition, we upgraded the cluster autoscaler component to a version which supports a significantly better observability in terms of the metrics that it exports and makes visible. Um, but there's still a couple of metrics that we haven't yet been able to um, introduced to the cluster autoscaler. We'd like it to be able to report what will happen. It reports what's unneeded, but not the actual uh, intended scale-in that it's going to perform. This is something that we know how to do. We just haven't gotten a chance to get to yet. Um, and along the way, we learned some interesting things. Um, specifically, um, and this may be germane, uh, it's somewhat speculative because we can't, couldn't conclusively prove this, but this. I suspect is germane to, to what hit us that day. Um, that, um, so first, first interesting thing we learned in this investigation was that the Kubernetes service, the cluster IP service that um, Kubernetes creates by default to be able to address the API server, often it shows up as Kubernetes default service cluster local. There is session affinity set on that service implicitly. Um, you don't create that service. That service is created by the API server. If you're running in a high availability configuration and you have multiple API servers present in your cluster, there's a number of different knobs and possible configurations you could be in. You could be advertising a load balancer, but if you're connecting directly to an API server, um, your clients that are addressing it in that way will be uh, pinned to one specific API server instance. On the face of it, that's not so surprising. There's a number of reasons why that's the case. Uh, this issue explains a bit. However, the second thing we learned is that the behavior of API servers when you're running with the API server count flag is surprising. Um, so uh, in short, what happens here is um, readiness is not respected uh, when the API server count flag is in play. So in our case, we run a five node control plane, five instances of etcd, five API servers, um, scheduler and controller manager and HE configurations, and we run with the API servers having the API server count set to five. Seems, seemed logical. Now, it, it turns out that the behavior with that um, setting is that all five of those API servers remain in the endpoint set for that service at all times. So if you're in a maintenance event and you don't um, change the count value, bring down one of your API servers, 20% of your traffic that is addressing those API servers over that cluster service are going to fail. Um, and it could actually be more. Because of, the client, because of the session affinity based on client IP, you can end up in situations where you have hotspots because the clients could, um, during maintenance operations, you could consolidate down to less than your total set of API servers. Um, now, the API server count issue, uh, the referenced um, pull request here uh, helpfully suggests that the behavior with API server count set greater to one is worse than just leaving it set to one. Um, I tend to agree. I think uh, 
basically this is something that I, there are, there is upstream work to change, but it's something to be aware of uh, where you have components addressing the API server over that service. We've seen an, a couple of issues around the scheduler and controller manager as well, especially during maintenance operations. This is where it's come up, is when we're uh, maintaining the control plane nodes and when we have to take one of those out of service, um, uh, we've, well, developed our maintenance procedures to work around this uh, because we got hit by it a couple times. Um, so something to be aware of. And the further speculation, getting, getting out past what I can strongly assert, but um, one possible explanation we sort of hypothesized about this cluster autoscaler incident and the 0.0, .0 utilization observed in the logs is that under some set of circumstances, which I can't name, the cluster autoscaler, when talking to the API server's metrics API, um, had some network connectivity which was um, deserialized into uh, in-memory representations in Go, and that Go's behavior of representing um, uninitialized values as the zero value of the type could potentially, and again, speculative here, but could potentially have resulted in an uninitialized float being uh, reported as a 0.0, .0 and then acted upon, um, resulting in the scaling behavior we described. Uh, don't let this happen to you. Uh, and as a side note, we, we have actually, so we mentioned that the smoothing function um, well, where were we here? Yes, that the smoothing function slow down. Um, we've upgraded to the newest release of the cluster autoscaler and we haven't been hit by this behavior, but we have seen intermittent, um, only very occasional, but we have once or twice seen reported in the cluster autoscaler logs that observed utilization was zero when in fact it was not. Um, so I, I'm throwing around a little bit of FUD there. I, don't, I, I guess uh, I don't personally completely understand the issue, but. Um, it may still be lurking out there in the woods. Be careful. Now I'm gonna move on. Um, we had a truly catastrophic outage, um, which we're calling the split personality etcd cluster. Um, so I was describing a bit about how our control plane maintenance procedures had grown to kind of work around this interaction of the API server count and session stickiness or session affinity um, of the API server communications from components that talk to the API server over the built-in cluster IP service. So our procedure for performing control plane node maintenance, which um, we occasionally have to do due to um, configuration updates, we treat our nodes, our control plane nodes included as sort of immutable, and when we need to update the underlying node configuration, that's uh, typically we'll, uh, almost universally, we will terminate one by one and sort of roll through the roll through the set and replace them with the with nodes of the new configuration. So given given what I just described, that means removing a member from the etcd quorum, uh, starting a new machine. Um, it also involves actually decrementing the API server uh, API server count flag on all the running API servers. Uh, did I say starting a new machine? We start a new machine. Um, that new machine, then we, we manually add that to the etcd quorum and then go back to all of the API servers and increment that API server count flag. And that allows us to work around the negative behavior that I described a moment ago. I'm telling you all this, it's gonna, it's gonna come back later. Now, in this incident, uh, we had a situation where nothing made sense. We were deeply confused. Um, we run cube control get pods, and we would get two different sets of data, and it would alternate back and forth. We would run cube control get nodes, and we would get two different sets of data, and it would alternate back and forth. And we couldn't make sense of it. It seemed like there were two opinions of what the state of the cluster was, what was going on. Um, and here's how it came up to us. Our user, this is, this is not ever a conversation you want to have as a cluster operator, and not because this is a self-identified Cubs fan, but because uh, pods starting up and vanishing is not supposed to, something that's supposed to happen here. So when we went and looked, we'd see this, and then this, and that flashed by pretty quickly, so it would go back and forth between these two states. Something like this, although obviously, depending on what resources you were looking at, you'd see different things. Um, this uh, was confusing, to say the least, as I already said. 
And it wasn't just about cube control and reporting to our sort of interactive querying of the state of the cluster. The control loop started misbehaving. So this manifested as the controller manager uh, acting on incorrect data. And this was thousands of pods um, getting spun up and terminated. Um, I don't, uh, that basically the cluster, or the controller manager would be querying API servers and um, getting alternating sets of data and then uh, helpfully, rapidly acting on alternating sets of data, trying to converge to some state, but uh, it's hard to converge when you're getting conflicting views of the world. The next set of um, you know, horrible symptoms that started manifesting was you know, service endpoints were thrashing, uh, our ingress controller started to do very bad things to the traffic that should have been flowing through it, or rather, uh, the ingress controller itself uh, was reasonably okay, but it just it was responding to these conflicting signals. So there's some bad news here. Uh, this was a full cluster outage on our primary production cluster. Um, we weren't simply out of service. It wasn't just sort of went away, but it was sort of violently wrong. Um, and our time to resolution was brutal. It was about a four hour outage for our, until we were able to restore cluster, or restore service by way of a replacement cluster. Um, there were a number of contributing factors that kind of led to that significant of a time to resolution. Um, one was you know, simply confusion, uh, but also we were reluctant to replace the cluster and spent a, a, quite a while troubleshooting and diagnosing. Um, we knew that replacement would mean um, re basically redeploying applications on the new cluster, and there was um, a fairly distributed relationship in terms of teams uh, utilizing features that are challenging to, uh, to simply migrate, pick up and move from cluster to cluster. Um, we did end up replacing the cluster. So all of our reluctance ended up being for naught, uh, and that was also contribu con uh, contributed to the delay and the, the duration of our outage. Um, so some specific things here, volumes are challenging. Volumes are um, exclusively bound to one node, so when we brought up workloads on the new cluster, we had to sort of go manually one by one and make sure that those were freed from the, um, the errant cluster in order to be, be able to bind them on the new cluster. Uh, but actually, load balancers were somewhat more challenging because um, although they were much fewer in number, the teams that were using load balancers, a, a handful of teams had um, created DNS records that pointed to the sort of ephemeral name that Kubernetes creates the load balancer with. And um, they had to manually update those DNS records to point to the new um, load balancer names that were created on the new cluster. And um, one could potentially wish for a little bit uh, better support on Kubernetes side in terms of making it possible to kind of claim ownership of, of an existing load balancer. I think it's maybe possible, but it's not a supported uh, use case. So basically, migrating load balancers is, is not uh, realistic. There's other ways to work around this in terms of managing the DNS records on the Kubernetes side is, is something that we've looked at but haven't um, gotten into place yet. It's, um, there's some other things that make that challenging. Um, there's some good news, though. So this happened during working hours. Hooray, nobody got woke up in, in the middle of the night. Um, so we had full team presence, and we were able to kind of uh, bring our full resources to bear. And another bit of good news is that we were able to analyze this one and, and actually get down to a root cause. And, um, and that root cause understanding did drive, or did lead to significant improvements in our sort of understanding of the system, its behavior under this failure mode, um, our code, and, and our procedures around that. Um, now you may be asking, but wait, how could this possibly happen? Etcd is a consistent key value store, right? That's the whole point. Um, it is, it is, and I'm not making any claim. We didn't observe split, split brain as described, um, which is a breakage of the consensus model itself. Um, but what we did see was uh, stale data. And uh, it's not super widely known, I don't think, but it is indeed documented that etcd will return stale data. There are known conditions under which that can occur. And um, typically, this is very small increments where the etcd members have you know, some small degree of replication lag in between them. A leader will accept writes and then replicate those to followers. Um, but under certain sets of scenarios, that lag can get very, very significant. And it can also get, if you have very significant lag, you can also in, enter situations where you're um, having leader thrashing because uh, leader election timeouts can be repeatedly crossed, causing multiple elections back to back to back. Um, 
And like I said, this is documented. And in fact, we had even read the manual um, and knew that there was at least some theoretical possibility of this. Um, at the time, which is to say earlier this year, six months ago, um, there wasn't widespread agreement that this, uh, that, oh, sorry, let me back up for just a second. So one piece of mitigation here, resolution actually, is to um, always ensure, demand that etcd perform uh, quorum operation when reads are, are happening. So stale data is in the read path, not in the write path. So writes are always consistent. And you'll always get an act that reflects the quorum of the cluster, the etcd cluster. But on the read path, etcd can return data that's only known to the local host, the, the local etcd instance that you're querying. Um, and that's the case unless you expressly request a quorum read. Quorum read um, involves a quorum of the cluster. And it happens to be the case that uh, Kubernetes API server and its default configuration does not request a quorum read. And it's not mentioned in the HA docs, or at least until October of this year, it wasn't mentioned in the HA docs. Um, there's another mea culpa here. We, we um, after having observed this, and then immediately going, after resolving the issue, immediately going to the HA docs and scratching our heads saying, how did we miss that? Um, found that it wasn't there. Um, it is now. So read the docs, read the docs like Sunday at noon, like it was church. Like those are changing and um, you have to stay up to date. And um, some, of the, some of the reason that that wasn't a recommended configuration from the beginning is that there was con concerns about the performance impact when, uh, when you're performing a quorum read on the read path, you have to talk to you know, uh, a quorum, so majority of your etcd members. And uh, etcd 3.1 greatly reduces the impact of that because reads don't have to hit disk anymore. Previously, that meant a disk hit on, on the you know, um, majority of your etcd cluster. And um, in 1.9, quorum reads become the default behavior. So um, if you're running 1.9, you're safe. If you're not running 1.9, you may not be safe. Um, uh, there, yeah, this might be something to go look at in your configs if you're running your own API server configs. So in our case, we know what happened. <laughs> we got hit by write latency. So etcd is extremely sensitive to write latency. Uh, this is healthy write latency. We're talking single digit milliseconds in this case. This is, this is a happy etcd instance, or a cluster actually. This is five etcd instances. This, this is not a happy etcd instance. So if you, if you start crossing double digit or multiple hundreds of milliseconds of write latency, and this is specifically the database sync lag, um, you're, you're entering a world of hurt, and etcd is going to start to do um, well, if you're not using quorum reads, you're potentially going to start to see behavior like we saw. Um, even with quorum reads, you're going to start to see you know, tremendously degraded performance because every operation is going to see, um, well, many of your operations are going to see significant lag. So how is it that we have missed such an important thing on such a critical database? Um, and the answer is really that there's just so much to to go figure out if you're running a, a Kubernetes cluster. Um, and to kind of demonstrate kind of what I'm trying to talk about, I mean, let's, let's talk about what happens at the node level. So this is from a, a great site uh, uh, published by Brendan Gregg, um, who posts a lot of topics about Linux performance. And if you need to figure out how to troubleshoot performance issues on a Linux node, this is a pretty good kind of roadmap to that. And as you can see, there's just a lot of different components you have to worry yourself about. And for each component, there's a different set of tools. Right? So now, as cluster operators, we don't run one node. We run dozens of nodes, and dozens of nodes each in dozens of clusters. Right? Um, and, uh, and so you really need to stay on top of this. But this isn't a small. Right? This is zoomed in down to the node. And if we take a zoom all the way back out, to the ecosystem, this is what we have to deal with. And in fact, Linux isn't even anywhere on this slide. Uh, so, uh, so not only do you need to deal with the operating system, but the cloud level and provisioning, you need to know the quirks of your cloud providers, because maybe they're going to transparently replace or scale in some of the nodes behind your load balancer, doing crazy things to your network traffic. Uh, you need to know about um, your container runtime. 
You need to know about the overlay network plugin that you're running. How is that performing for you? Uh, you need to know, obviously, about Kubernetes itself how the scheduler interacts with the API server and how the kubelets talk to each other and the uh, controller managers and everything. And then don't forget that super critical 300 megabit da database called etcd that's really sensitive to write latencies. Um, and, uh, and as you can tell, there's a, a, the surface area is huge, absolutely huge. Um, but here's the thing. Full-stack DevOps teams have had to deal with something like this for years because, you know, it may not be Kubernetes, but they still have to deal with their applications, the deployments, the cloud, the provisioning, the operating systems, the virtual machines, the networking, the DNS, the load balancers, all of that stuff. And what Kubernetes provides for the application teams, at least, is a simple interface through which to run their applications and then push all that responsibility onto somebody else, the cluster operators. So that's the good news, good for them. As for us cluster operators, well, any number of small things could possibly turn into a big issue. Um, and so surely, out of this diagram and the, and the one before, there must be 101 or more ways for your cluster to come tumbling down. Thank you.